started. First of all, what a treat to have a first Wednesday in June. How lucky are we? Um, so uh, you, you may recall that this was scheduled for winter time, and we had a few snowstorms and uh, a few cancellations. So you know, it just um, prolonged the anticipation, which we all know is a key part of happiness. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have lists of all the major characters that are on the table as you come in. And I want to thank Russ for suggesting that we print these out for everybody in the audience um, so that you can remember that all the wonderful people you met when you read this book um, last winter. So, uh, the other thing I would like to announce is that um, please do sign in so that the Humanities Council knows where you're from and um, how many people are here. Also, please to pick up an evaluation form and fill that out because they really do want to know what you think and they want your ideas for other um, programs to have in the future. So tonight, we are really fortunate to have Judith Frank with us. She is a professor from uh, Amherst. And um, first of all, I need to tell you, thanks to all the people and all the groups that sponsor these wonderful uh, events for us. The Alma Gibbs Donchen Foundation, the National Life Group Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, a personal favorite, um, which is through the Vermont Department of Libraries. And our series underwriter for all the Brattleboro programs is Union Institute and University. The underwriter of this talk is Carol and Jeff Gaddis, and Carol's here with us tonight. Um, and then as I mentioned, Judith is here. She holds a BA from Hebrew University and an MFA and PhD from Cornell. She is the author of a book of criticism, Common Ground, 18th Century English Satiric Fiction and the Poor, which was published by Stanford University Press, and two novels, Cry Baby Butch, which was awarded a 2004 Lambda Literary Award, and All I Love and Know. In 2008, she received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and she's been a resident at Yaddo and the McDowell Colony, and has published short fiction in the Massachusetts Review, Other Voices, and Best Lesbian Love Stories 2005. She teaches English and creative writing at Amherst College, which I saw her office, so I know it's true. <laughs> and she lives with her partner and two children in Amherst. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Star. Thank you to Humanities Councils and public libraries here and everywhere for the work that you do. So I'm here tonight to talk about um, one of my favorite novels in the world, um, The Known World by Edward P. Jones, which was published in 2009. The New Yorker called it a work of tremendous moral intricacy. It won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction and was a finalist for the National Book Award. Kirkus Reviews wrote, the particulars and consequences of the right of humans to own other humans are dramatized with unprecedented ingenuity and intensity. This will mean a great deal to a great many people. It does indeed mean a great deal to me and my students, both as a work of tremendous moral intricacy and power and as a fascinating example of the things that novels can do. I'm especially interested in its characters and how Jones characterizes, which I'll be talking about tonight. I hope to illuminate an element of this novel and also along the way to provoke some thoughts about the technique of characterization itself and about how novels hold us in the space of characters. As Valerie Martin wrote in a review of The Known World in The Guardian, summarizing the plot of this rewarding novel is a hopeless enterprise. A lot happens. Time is fluid. Because of the snow cancellation that delayed this talk, many of you had time to read it. Um, in, um, and I wrote this at a time, I wrote this when you had not yet had time to read it. So can I just ask who has, who has had time to read it? Who has read it? It's not like in class where if you haven't read it, it's bad. Um, okay, that's good to know. So I'm going to quickly summarize for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, the Known World opens with the death of Henry Townsend, an owner of 33 slaves in fictional Manchester County, Virginia in 1855. 
Harry, Henry Townsend is a black man whose freedom was bought by his father, Augustus, who purchased his own freedom and that of his wife and son with the earnings he made as a carpenter. He is part of a group of eight families of free black men in the county who own slaves. The novel flashes back to Henry's childhood as the favored groom and then bootmaker of his white master, William Robbins, his freedom, the purchase of his first slave, Moses, who helps him build his house and becomes the overseer, his education by Fern Elston, who teaches reading and literature to the children of free blacks. On his deathbed, he asks his wife, Caledonia, to read aloud for Milton's Paradise Lost. His marriage to Caledonia, his attempts to be a better master than most, but in his inevitable corruption by the institution of slavery and his eventual death. But even as it follows that through line, the novel, told in a powerful, sometimes grandstanding, omniscient narration, broadens out. There are, according to some enterprising and quantitatively minded students of mine, 169 total characters in the novel. <laughs> 74 slaves, 27 free blacks, and 68 whites slash others. And this is, I walked into a classroom that was not our classroom one day, and I found this on the board. It says, please don't erase. Please, please, please do not erase before the state. And it was, I was looking at it, and I thought, this, these are the characters of the known world. These people diagrammed the characters. They categorized them, they diagrammed them. You can see the diagrams there. Here's a whole bunch. Huh. There is a group that they call random ass people. Um, those are my students. Um, and they, um, yeah, so these are all of the, and, and so we counted 169 wow. total. They got extra credit. Um, that was great. They are almost exclusively minor characters. It's hard to pick a major character in the novel. Moses, the overseer, who sleeps with Henry's widow after his death and hopes that she will marry him and set him free, is the closest the novel comes to a major character. We know he's important because the novel opens and closes with him and because he has a weighty and significant biblical name. Other characters who come close to major status are Alice, a slave called the woman without a mind, whose crazy, grotesque rantings allow her strange access to the roads around Henry's plantation by patrollers who are unnerved by her, but deem her harmless. Fern Elston, the teacher who passes for white, but chooses to live as a free black woman, whose education and charismatic authority make the free black young people around her pay court to her. John Skiffington, the white sheriff, whose Christianity has made him vow to never own slaves, and then who was given a slave girl by his malicious cousin counsel as a wedding present. And given the culture he lives in, can't free her, so takes her in as a quasi-daughter. The plot of the novel concerns the fate of the plantation after Henry's death as slaves begin to disappear, and as characters come together in a final conflagration that leaves many of them dead. It's a lot. Tonight I want primarily to think about what the novel does with this multitude of minor characters. I'll start by giving you an example. In a chapter that takes place in the novel's past, in Henry's childhood, Augustus and Mildred Townsend come to pick up their son, whose freedom they have just succeeded in purchasing from William Robbins' plantation. But there's a hitch. Rita, the woman who's been mothering Henry in his parents' absence while he remained a slave, follows their wagon as it drives off, pleading, please don't leave me. Augustus and Mildred beg her to turn back. It's a terrifying scene, a slave simply walking off a plantation, Henry crying and begging them to let her come with, Augustus saying, we'll be dead by morning. Finally, they take her to their house and Augustus has an idea. He packs her in a wooden box of intricately carved walking sticks he made, which he is sending to an Irish merchant in New York. A new passage begins. It was 41 hours before Rita in the box got to New York. The box was opened with a crowbar by the merchant's wife, a broad-shouldered Irish woman he had met on the HMS Thames's 20th trip to America. The Irish woman's first husband had died only one day out of Cork Harbor, leaving her alone with five children. The captain had the husband's body coffined only in the clothes the man had died in and his head wrapped in a piece of family lace 
tossed overboard after 10 Lord's prayers and 10 Hail Marys were spoken by the man's oldest child, a boy of eight. The boy, Timothy, had struggled through 10 of each when the captain, a German Protestant, thought one of each would have done. An Irish prayer was obviously worth only a tenth of what a German prayer was worth. <laughs> the boy could not bear to see his father go, and everyone assembled could tell that in all the words of the prayers. A month into the voyage, the Irish woman's youngest child died, a girl of some five months. Twenty Lord's prayers and twenty Hail Marys from Timothy. A coffin of lace for baby Agnes, that lace being the last of the family fortune. This is only the first half of the section on the merchant's wife. Mary O'Donnell Conlon, to whom Jones gives a name and a maiden name. Note the other bountiful specificities in the passage. It's the HMS Thames's 20th trip to America. The husband who is buried at sea is wearing the clothes he died in, his head wrapped in a piece of family lace. The oldest child has a name, Timothy, and an age, eight. The captain is a German Protestant. The baby has a name, Agnes, and an age, some five months. The lace on her coffin is the last of the family fortune. All of this happens before the scene when Mary O'Donnell Conlin opens the box of walking sticks with the slave hidden inside. One of the main things they give us is the sense, this scene gives us is a sense of Joan's lavish imagination. None of these details matters at all. You can't plausibly argue that if they were missing, the novel would be somehow impoverished. And I think that students are really trained in college to think about detail in, in, in novels as though it's indispensable, as though everything matters. And in a way it does. But that's easier to do in poetry than it is to do in fiction. And in a way it does. But in this novel it doesn't. I mean, it gives us something grand. But if it were gone and you read it again tomorrow, I'm not sure you would notice. I'm not sure that the novel would feel less powerful to you either. <coughs> When you start reading about Mary O'Donnell Conlon, you wonder, fretfully, how much should I invest in her life? Will she be important to the novel? I doubt it. So should I just skim this? Well, what if it turns out to be super important? And what about Rita? As readers who have formed an emotional investment in her, we're anxiously waiting to see if she arrives alive, how the people opening the crate respond. She does arrive alive. Quote, slowly she opened her eyes and saw Mary. Don't send me back. Indeed, reading the known world makes us wonder about how much to invest in any given character all the time as we try to keep track of its 169 minor characters, unsure which we should pay particular attention to, which deserves our emotional investment more than others. The novel disrupts our normal modes of reading in a way that feels ir irritating and frustrating, at least at the beginning, before we've gotten into the swing of things. But you learn the rules, right? You learn as you go what it's going to be like. It's interesting to note the novel was marketed as the story of a single character, or two different ones. The back cover is about Moses. It reads, he was 35 years old, and for every moment of those years, he had been somebody's slave. A white man's slave, and then another white man's slave, and now for nearly 10 years, the overseer's slave for a black master. And the inside flap tells us the known world tells the story of Henry Townsend, a black farmer and former slave who falls under the tutelage of William Robbins, the most powerful man in Manchester County, Virginia. The publicity department of Jones's publisher, Amistad Press, presented it as a novel with a clear protagonist, as the kind of novel that would seem familiar to us. <laughs> Clearly, they thought that it would be difficult to market a novel comprised of over 150 <laughs> minor characters. I'm not sure I would have plucked it off the shelf or clicked on it if I'd known that in advance. So I'm going to try to give a reading of what the known world is up to when it disrupts our emotional investments. But first I want to take a detour through a work of literary criticism that I admire, which is Alex Wallach's The One Versus the Many, Minor Characters in the Space of the Protagonist in the novel. Wallach's book was also published in 2009, and it offers an unprecedentedly thorough theory of the minor character. Wallach begins by formulating the idea of the character space. Character space, Wallach tells us, is that particular and charged encounter between an individual human personality and a determined space and position within the narrative as a whole. 
This definition brings together the world of what we call the reference, which is the implied human being behind the character, the human being we imagine as we read, who feels more or less real to us, who we get invested in, who we sometimes think of as our friends, right? And the world of the narrative, the way that the character is represented by the system of words written on a page, and crucially, the space which it is given. Why is character space a particular and charged encounter between the two? Because the fullness of human personality is necessarily circumscribed by the space given to it in the narrative. This happens with all characters, but the encounter is particularly charged for the more highly circumscribed characters, the ones given less space, the minor characters. Minor characters, according to Wallach, normally enter the narrative in a functional capacity to help elucidate and flesh out and interpret the story of the protagonist. In the case of the 19th century Bildungsroman or coming of age novel, for example, each encounter with a minor character has a particular psychological function within the interior development of the young protagonist. Minor characters stand for particular states of mind or psychological modes that the protagonist interacts with and transcends. But every time, Wallach says, every time a minor character enters a narrative, it threatens to destabilize it, to make its own unique consciousness the center, to take up more space. For as Wallach writes, oh, I didn't, didn't put it on the, thing, on the slide. As he writes, each of these narrative workers also has an orienting consciousness that like the protagonist's own consciousness could potentially organize an entire fictional universe. Any novelist who has sketched a minor character because she needed a friend for the protagonist or a boss or an ex and has found that character unexpectedly fascinating and found herself wondering what else she can give the character to do <laughs> and then the character takes over a little too much and you have to go back and cut, knows what it's like to have a minor character threaten to destabilize her narrative. Indeed, as Wallach points out, many novelists are aware of the way in which constraining a character within their delimited function can feel problematic and even ethically problematic because human beings take up more weight and deserve more attention than they can fill in a limited role, in this limited role. As Henry James wrote about the minor characters in The Wings of the Dove, they too should have a case. Like he felt uncomfortable. Um, they too, those minor characters, they should have a case too. I'm just using them for something else. And function itself, as Wallach continues, took on a new social meaning in 19th century Europe as industrialization and an economic stratification hardened a division of labor that constricted full human beings to increasingly specialized roles, which is to say turned human beings into functions. Wallach shows how the great 19th century novelists, who were highly class conscious and mindful of social inequality, thematized the ways in which minor characters were the proletariat of the novel. He calls one kind of minor character the worker, the character that is smoothly absorbed into the novel's narrative gears, that is reduced to a single function in the narrative. So in Wallach's view, the novel is a kind of arena in which characters compete for space. Hence the title, The One Versus the Many. The tension between the one and the many becomes especially pressing in the realist novel, which has always been praised for two contradictory achievements. The depth of its psychology on the one hand, and its social expansiveness on the other. Depicting the interior life of a singular consciousness, and casting a wide narrative gaze over a complex social universe. You can see how those two imperatives depth and breadth would compete with each other. In the known world, the minor characters who are slaves are within the functional world quite literally workers reduced to sheer function, their humanness de denied. They are often referred to in the novel by the white characters as the property or that property. And we can feel the tension between granting them singular consciousness and casting a wide narrative gaze over the complex social universe of Manchester County. Indeed, this dynamic is particularly urgent and poignant in a novel about slavery, because even the implied human life of the characters has already been so harshly delimited by slave culture, 
and a writer might feel the need to flesh them out in compensation, to imagine them as richly and resonantly and humanly as he can, to claim they are people, they are rich, complex people. So let me show you some of the ways Jones creates depth in his many characters. I'm gonna show you a bunch of examples. When we meet Loretta, Caldonia's maid, we hear, Loretta was 32 years old. When the day came when all the slaves were slaves no more and decided that they should choose a last name for themselves, she would not pick Townsend or Blueberry or Freeman or Godspeed or Bad Memory as many would. She would choose nothing and she stayed with nothing even when she decided to marry. I mean, I love that she would choose nothing, but he's giving you so many amazing examples of what she could have chosen, right? And the things that people might have chosen. Here's another about Minerva, the young girl given as a wedding gift to John Skiffington. Minerva went to the window nearest her and looked out to where the sun was still rising. She had an older sister back in North Carolina, and every morning back home she could look down where the sun was coming up to the neighboring farm where her sister was a slave. Minerva and her sister would not see each other again for more than 20 years. It would be in Philadelphia, nine blocks from the Philadelphia School for Girls. You done growed, her sister would say, both hands to Minerva's cheeks. I would have held back on growing up, Minerva would say. I would have waited for you to see me grow, but I had no choice in the matter. <laughs> and another. As the slaves gather at the house to be given the news of Henry's death, Elias has been carving his five-year-old Tessie a doll. She began skipping, but an adult told her that a human being had died and skipping should be left off to another day. Tessie would soon be six years old and being the child of her parents, who she was, she listened and stopped skipping. Tessie would live to be 97 years old and the doll her father was making for her would be with her until her last hour. She and the doll, long missing the corn silk hair Elias, her father, had put on it, would outlive two of her children and the doll would outlive her. Two other children in that crowd are three-year-old twins, Caldonia and Henry. The twins would live to be 88 years old. Caldonia would die first, and though her brother Henry had a good and happy life, that should be life, with a good wife and many offspring with their offspring, he decided to follow his sister. She's never led me wrong in all this time, he said to his best friend over drinks the night before he decided to up and die. I don't think she'll leave me wrong this one last time. In one way, these details, the swift projection into the future, interrupt our attention from the moment we're in. They force our attention from the character in the fictive world to the narrator and its prodigious omniscience. You can even hear the inventing author behind it. As a novelist myself, I think, dang, Edward, now you're just showing off. Do we want to be paying attention to the narrator here in the one moment we're getting some character depth? I'll come back to the effects of that omniscience, but first I want to think about what these characterizations offer. It's always struck me as I read this novel how old these slaves lived to. Mm. I think about all the things we do to extend our lives and about the horrifying work conditions, medical care, and legal systems slaves live under. I think about the reduced life expectancy of American black people even today as a result of some version of those very factors and it seems improbable that these slaves would live so long. I read Jones's projections into the future as giving his characters a kind of compensatory abundance, compensatory for the human impoverishness, impoverishment they've suffered as slaves. Sometimes it's years or even generations, as in the case of Elias and Celeste, married slaves who lose a baby when Moses forces Celeste to go out to the fields while she's in late pregnancy. The generations of Elias and Celeste Freeman are so legion that in 1993, the University of Virginia Press would publish a 415 page book by a white woman, Marsha H. Shea, documenting that every 97th person in the Commonwealth of Virginia was kin by blood or by marriage to the line that started with Celeste and Elias Freeman. This did not happen by the way, but notice 1993, University of Virginia Press, a white woman, her name, right? The, I mean, just the, uh, just the astonishing detail in that sentence. Sometimes the compensation takes the form of a reunion like that between Minerva and her sister. 
In the case of one slave, Stamford, it's becoming so important as the founder of a home for orphaned black children that he gets a street in Richmond named after him. One of the most devastating strands of the plot concerns Augustus, Henry's father, being accosted by patrollers, one of whom eats his free papers and sells him to profiteers. In the wagon with him is an eight-year-old girl who dies. Stennis had dumped the dead child, Abundance, on the side of the road long before they hit North Carolina, the child who had been coughing since Manchester. Darcy and Stennis had kidnapped Abundance Crawford, a free girl suffering from a cold, as she walked down a road outside of Fredericksburg in her new shoes. She would have turned nine years old in two more weeks. To me, Abundance Crawford, who takes up perhaps two-thirds of a page in this 389-page novel, and note how you have to get through three other named characters in my account just to get to her, is, aside from Moses, the most resonantly named character in this novel. Her name, Abundance, evokes implied human beings we don't even meet. We're not even sure who they are. Her parents? Just her mother? What even counts as family in a system that routinely tears families apart? These human beings came together and, impressed and expressed by the word abundance their feelings about living in this universe and having this baby, their hope for her, their gratitude, what having her meant to them, and who knows, maybe their gratitude for being free, gratitude for a good crop or wishes for a better crop to come. It's the tension between the implied world her name implies and her extreme minorness, she is just a dead body being dumped into the road, that makes this seem particularly painful and that makes it feel like a kind of emblem for many of the characterizations in the novel. Indeed, the dilemma of characterization, of trying to evoke an abundance of human life into limited space, is something the novel explicitly meditates upon in moments where characters mourn their loved ones. When characters mourn in the known world, they invariably produce narratives that are excessive to the space allowed. When Henry dies at the beginning, for example, we hear, in their cabin, Augustus and Mildred, his parents, lay down and held each other. One of them started talking. They would not remember which one it was, all about Henry from his birth to his death, starting a weeks-long project of recalling all that they could about their son. If they had known how to read and write, they could have put it all in a book of 2,000 pages. <laughs> Later, a young boy named Luke, who is incomparably sweet and beloved by Elias and Celeste, is killed by overwork. Jones writes, Moffat, the minister, was early to the boy's funeral, and Moffat said some words at the gravesite, but no one said more than Elias, and at the last, his new wife had to put her arms around him to bring an end to all the words. The imperative to say things about the dead is not limited to the, to the novel's black characters. A patroller named Barnum Kinsey dies in the novel's projected future, and his oldest son from his second marriage, Matthew, stayed up all the night before he was buried, putting his father's history on a wooden tombstone. He began with his father's name on the first line, and on the next he put the years of his father's coming and going. Then all the things he knew his father had been. Husband, father, farmer, grandfather, patroller, tobacco man, tree baker. The letters of the words got smaller and smaller as the boy, not quite 12, neared the bottom of the wood because he had never made a headstone for anyone before, so he had not compensated for all that he would have to put on it. The boy filled up the whole piece of wood, and at the end of the last line, he put a period. The surviving loved ones of Luke, Henry, Barnum Kinsey, these are figures for the writer and his dilemma of characterization. Yes? Patroller is a white man who catches runaway slaves. They are the villains of, of the novel. Uh, they, these are figures for the writer and his dilemma of characterization, having more to say, feeling ethically responsible to recount more imagined and implied life than you have space for. The known world is partly about that. In one memorable scene in the middle of the novel, the slave Stamford, the one who gets the street named after him, shows us something of the writer's ethical imperative to characterize even the most minor characters. 
Slavery has made Stamford existentially and punishingly sad. There's a wrenching scene in which he strains to remember his mother and father's names, where only the fact of his navel convinces him that he was once somebody's baby. Mm -hmm. Remember, he, he's the one who comes out, he's so obnoxious at the beginning, he, he's trying to get all these young women to be with him because somebody told him, if you get enough good stuff, you will be able to survive. While out one day collecting blueberries for a little girl, Stanford has a powerful experience, or perhaps a vision. There's thunder and lightning, cabins flying, an oak tree that becomes a glorious blaze of yellow light, as though a million candles had been placed in it. In the scene of his vision, Stamford tries to kill himself by walking into the lightning, but the lightning eludes him. Crows have been struck and lie dead on the ground. Hmm. Stamford licked his fingers and rubbed them on each bird. I just need a little to get me over to the other side, he said to the first crow. He closed his eyes and waited for death. He began talking to the second bird. Now don't be stingy with what you got. He continued to rub his fingers on them and lick his hand. He talked to each bird separately as if the history he had with one was distinct and different from the one he had with the other. To speak to them as a couple, as one unit, would be disrespectful to the history he shared with either. Joining himself to the crows with his spit, hoping their magical ability to die will rub off on him literally rub off on him. Stanford is at the same time aware of the ethics of addressing them. In that, he acts like the story's narrator. Individuating the crows is an act of respect for the history he shares with each. Indeed, what can be known in the known world extends beyond the human to the animal world as well. Even its crows, its many horses and mules and cows, some named and some not, have a pull on our attention and interest. As I noted earlier, Wallach proposes the category of the worker, the minor character that is smoothly absorbed into the novel's narrative gears, that is reduced to a single function in the narrative. Another complementary category he proposes is the eccentric, the minor character that grates against his or her position and is usually, as a consequence, wounded, exiled, expelled, ejected, imprisoned, or killed. An example of a famous Eccentric is Bertha Mason in Jane Eyre, the mad woman shut up in the attic, who is also shut up within the narrative discourse, revealed only in sporadic passages that present her in fragmentary form, but whose interior life explodes out in continued outbreaks of her violent and unreasonable temper. Another is Lydia Bennett in Pride and Prejudice, who tries to become a major character in a Jane Austen novel, like her sisters Elizabeth and Jane, by eloping with Wickham. If she does not marry him, Elizabeth says, she will be lost forever. She is consequently exiled from her family to the north of England. Moses, the overseer, whom Crazy Alice disparagingly calls Little Mars, is the primary eccentric in the known world. When Henry Townsend dies, Moses begins to appear in Caldonia's parlor to report on the day's events on the plantation. Over time, he begins telling her long, fanciful, ingratiating stories about Henry's feelings and ambitions when they built the house together, and then he and Caldonia sleep together several times. His hopes that this intimacy will lead to her freeing him and marrying him are intense, and he begins to think about his own family. That evening was the first time Moses would think that his wife and child could not live in the same world with him and Caldonia. Had they made love in silence, he would not have begun to think beyond himself. But she had spoken of tomorrow, and that meant more tomorrows after that. Where did a slave wife and a slave son fit in with a man who was on his way to being freed and then marrying a free woman on his way to becoming Mr. Townsend? He came, he came down from Caldonia's house that evening and stood at the entrance to the lane. Where does a man put a family he does not need? Moses sends his family away, forcing them to escape, forcing them, in his attempt to be a major character, out of the narrative. Priscilla cries, Lord Moses, why are you throwing us away like this? And they do disappear for a while, their fates unknown to us. Later, Moses has a dark night of the soul, and he takes off himself. But he is world stupid, as a fellow slave calls him. He knows every inch of the plantation, but nothing beyond it. Think of the title, The Known World, here. And he starts walking south instead of north. 
When he is caught, he is hobbled. A patroller saws through his Achilles tendon. A minor character who is graded against his position, against being a mere function, Moses will not be able to walk normally again. His biblical name becomes resonance. He has sent his people into freedom, but he himself will be denied the opportunity to set foot in the promised land. The others, novel's other primary eccentric, can you guess who that might be? Or do you have a sense of who the other eccentric might be? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Is Alice, right? The crazy slave who's said to have been kicked in the head by a mule on her previous plantation, even though we know, via the initial narrator, that that can't be true. That no one knew enough about the place she had come from to know that her former master was terrified of mules and would not have had them on his place, and even vanished pictures and books about mules from his little world. Alice, who sings crude songs in her nighttime wanderings, who lifts her skirts, in front of the patrollers who is allowed on the roads at night because she's just a nuisance is sent away by Moses with his wife and child. Suddenly, we get a different view of her. In the woods, Priscilla began crying, Moses, why can't you come now? Please, Moses, please. Alice stepped up to her and slapped Priscilla twice. Moses said nothing and Jamie said nothing. Who was this new woman? Who was this Alice acting like this in the night? She said, you just stop all that crying right now. I won't have it. Not one tear ever watered my thirst, and it won't water yours neither. So stop it all right now. Alice has been an eccentric character in both senses, strange and expelled from the novel. But then she isn't. We are reunited with her and Loretta at the unexpected and stunning end of the known world. The novel's second to last scene is written in first person, the only first person passage in the novel as a letter from Calvin, Caldonia's brother, to her in 1861. Calvin is a minor character who has lived in an uneasy relation to slavery throughout the novel. He's a free black man whose mother and sister own slaves. He's gay and doesn't dare reveal himself. He works alongside the slaves in his mother's field. Once, when he harshly reprimands a slave for not showing proper deference, he is filled with self-loathing. Like many a closeted gay character before him in both literature and life, Calvin has escaped his rural upbringing and landed in the city, in this case, Washington, D.C. He has a lemon drink in a bar in a hotel on C Street and writes. And this is gonna be a long quotation because it's a long, glorious scene. I could see people coming and going from a room next to the saloon. I assumed it was the dining area of the establishment. I drank the last of my courage and decided to investigate that particular room. It was indeed a dining room, a rather large one with more than 30 tables. But I discovered that that was not why people were coming and going, dear sister. The dinner hours were over and supper was still a time away. No, people were viewing an enormous wall hanging, a grand piece of art that is part tapestry, part painting, and part clay structure all in one exquisite creation, hanging silent and yet songful on the eastern wall. It is, my dear Caldonia, a kind of map of life of the county of Manchester, Virginia. But a map is such a poor word for such a wondrous thing. It is a map of life made with every kind of art man has ever thought to represent himself. Yes, clay. Yes, paint. Yes, cloth. There are no people on that map just all the houses and barns and roads and cemeteries and wells in our Manchester. It is what God sees when he looks down on Manchester. At the bottom right-hand corner of this creation, there were but two stitched words, Alice Knight. I stood transfixed. At about 2.30, there were few people in the dining room, only those preparing the table for the evening meals, stepped closer to this vision which was held way away from all by a blue rope of hemp. I raised my hand to it, not to touch, but to try to feel more of what was emanating. Someone beside me said quietly, oh, I'm sorry, please do not touch. I turned and saw Moses' Priscilla. Her hands were confidently behind her back, her clothing impeccable. I knew in those few seconds that whatever she had been in Virginia, she was that no more. It was then that I noticed over her shoulder another creation of the same materials, paint, clay, and cloth. 
I had been so captivated by the living map of the county that I had not turned to see the other wonder on the opposite wall. How have you been, Calvin? Priscilla inquired. She had no fear in her words that I might have come to take her back. Her words conveyed only what she had said, a need to know my condition. I responded, I have tried to be well, Priscilla. I have tried very hard. What he means by that we can talk about. I'm not sure what he means by that. I could still see over her shoulder that other creation. Priscilla saw it in my eyes and moved aside. This creation may well be even more miraculous than the one of the county. This one is about your home, Caldonia. It is your plantation. And again, it is what God sees when he looks down. There is nothing missing, not a cabin, not a barn, not a chicken, not a horse. Not a single person is missing. I suspect that if I were to count the blades of grass, the number would be correct as it was once when the creator of this work knew that world. And again, in the bottom right-hand corner are the stitched words, Alice Knight. In this massive miracle on the western wall, you, Caldonia, are standing before your house with Loretta, Zetti, and Bennett. As I said, all the cabins are there, and standing before them are the people who lived in them ere Alice, Priscilla, and Jamie disappeared. Except for those three, every single person is there, standing and waiting as if for a painter and his easel to come along and capture them in the glory of the day. Each person's face, including yours, is raised up as though to look in the very eyes of God. I look at all the faces and I am more glad now that I knew the name and face of everyone there at your home. The dead in the cemetery have risen from there and they too stand at the cabins where they once lived. So the slave cemetery is just plain ground now, grass and nothing else. It is empty, even of the tiniest infants who rest alive and well in their mother's arms. In the cemetery where our Henry is buried, he stands by his grave, but that grave is covered with flowers as though he still inhabits it. There are matters in my memory that I did not know were there until I saw them on that wall. I must tell you, dear Caldonia, that I sank to my knees. When I was able to collect myself, I stood and found not only Priscilla watching me, but Alice as well. I spoke to Alice thus, I hope you have been well. What I feared most at that moment is what I still fear, that they would remember my history, that I, no matter what I had always said to the contrary, owned people of our race. I feared that they would send me away, and even as I write you now, I am still afraid. Alice responded to me, I've been good as God keeps me. <laughs> Alice has graded against her position as minor, and she is rewarded for it. Exile in the known world, this novel conjures, a world of slavery, is a space of freedom and creativity. The woman without a mind dancing on the roads at night, a character whose irritating nonsensical chatter has made us skim over her and not accord her much importance, has become, in freedom, a powerful artist who has named herself after the night, a character who rivets our attention. Her art is a wonder, a miracle, so sublime it makes Calvin sink to his knees. In awe, with an overwhelming flood of memory, with a powerful regret, with fear. Calvin's falling to his knees, I believe, encourages a similar response from the reader, or simulates how the reader might react at that point. When you see Alice Knight that first time, that just, you sink to your knees. You don't literally sink to your knees, you are as though sinking to your knees. We are in awe of the sheer massive scale of the artwork, but also of the way Jones has surprised us has pulled a character out of his hat using narrative magic in the most beautiful way. It's not a trick ending, it's not cheap. Indeed, we could have seen it coming if we were looking close enough, and maybe some of you did look close enough. Alice, we suddenly remember, appears in the very first scene in which Jones has Moses alone in the woods, quiet, lying down on the ground in the rain and pleasuring himself. He did not know it, but Alice, a woman people said had lost her mind, was watching him now. As we are placed by the omniscient narrator beside him in this intimate space of watching a man alone, Alice has been watching too. It turns out that the freedom Alice's purported insanity gives her to roam has been the freedom of the artist all along, the freedom to stand outside of her society and look at it with critical distance. 
She has seen not only the plantation, but every building, well, road, and cemetery of the entirety of Manchester County. The world she has known has been wider than we could ever guess. And so, like Calvin, we also fall to our knees with awe, but also with something like regret or rueful self-criticism. Alice has been the most devalued possible character, not only a slave, but a slave without a mind. We knew all along that she's not crazy, but she sure acts crazy. Did we look closely enough? Did we imagine the depth behind her limited space in the novel? The art Jones invents for her is not realistic. How could one piece of art portray every single person and animal on the plantation, including the risen dead, every building and outbuilding and blade of grass? How would they all fit in? How could a hanging of tapestry, paint, and clay stay up on the wall? Her art is the product of prodigious omniscience, as Calvin says twice what God sees when he looks down on Manchester. It achieves ultimate breadth, fitting in every character and more. It's a figure, as you can tell, for Jones's novel itself, a work of art where he displays his own omniscience in bold, extravagant ways, where our attention is split not only by the many characters competing for space, but also between honoring the depth he strives to give his characters and our admiration for the astonishing imagination he displays as he does so. The known world asks, out of the multitudes of people drawn into and destroyed physically, ethically, metaphysically, by the slaveholding South, who has a right to our attention and empathy? And how can our minds encompass the millions enslaved? What kind of consideration of them is our mind capable of? What kind of art can do justice to them? Realism itself, Alice's art seems to tell us, can't encompass them all. You need to take leaps into the magical, the fantastical, to do that, to get it all in. Jones's ambition, an aesthetic one and an ethical one as well, is to bring life, bring to life the living and the dead, the human and the non-human, down to the blades of grass. Only that seems to be able to do justice to this world. In interviews, Jones explicitly calls himself the god of the people in the book. Hmm. Like the miracle that is Alice's artistic point of view, his bold omniscience is a constant, surprising, and magical reminder that the depth and humanity of each character are within his purview and his imaginative grasp. And like Alice, and through Alice, Jones displays the extravagance and brilliance of black creativity. Just as Elias and Celeste Freeman are given the compensatory abundance of a legion of descendants, his narrative, claiming for itself a godlike vision, is the abundantly imaginative and creative afterlife of this brutal world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, oh, there you are. I was like, there's a I voice am. coming. <laughs> it's Star. Where is she? The omniscient voice. Exactly. <laughs> um, so we will have um, uh, questions and answers. Uh, well, questions and answers uh, and a discussion. Um, but if anybody needs to leave now, here's a little opportunity for you to mosey on. Um, and I do ask that if you do have a question, can you put your hand up and wait till you have the mic and talk right into the mic like I'm doing right now. And then everybody can hear. Um, any questions or comments? Hand back uh -huh. Yeah, all right. As the curator of the research, as the curator of the research archive, don't lower your voice. I have a dilemma. Uh, I have original material, civil war, and in a discussion place like this, what is the PC or whatever as far as using the M word? I find myself thinking over that and not use, I don't know what to do. Um, I, I, I'll read in class sometimes, I'll read aloud passages which have it in. And what I'll do is often just talk beforehand um, with students and say, I'm going to read. I'm going to, I'm going to read what is there. Um, and I recognize as I'm doing that that I'm putting this out there, um, putting out something that I 
don't want to put out in the world. Um, um, and I recognize that, and I'm going to try to be true to the text at the same time. I think just acknowledging it is, is the way I, I don't know if it's satisfying, if it's satisfactory to people, but that's how I try to do it. The um, figure I just have to live with the discomfort. I think that's right. Why shouldn't we be uncomfortable? That's the other, that, I think that's right. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Anyone else? Me. Oh, oh. Um, Hang on, wait for the mic. Okay. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll just hold it in front of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you have to have a mic. Um, I didn't understand the reason of this novel that you're reading. Are you against it? Or oh my god, I love it. I mean, uh, your belief in it? I, I don't know what, why you picked this novel and why why I picked it. Yeah. I, for a few reasons. First of all, I think it's unbelievably powerful. I think it's a riveting read. I think it's um, it's imagination and its breadth are unlike anything I've ever seen. And I will say, he did not go to archives for much of this. He made up, even there's census data in the novel that he invented, right, yeah. Um, and just the unbelievable imagination, the beauty of that just blows me away. It's also a really um, compelling story of people's people's desires for freedom. And I love that as well. And it has all these characters, so it's kind of interesting as a test case. This is something to talk about as well. Yes. I wonder if you can say something about the title, The Known World. And um, I remember a scene, I think it was the sheriff, mm -hmm. who has the map on the wall. That's right. That he doesn't fully appreciate, I think. Right. And is that connected with the title? I'm just curious. Every time that. I see the known world, I'm like, hmm, that, that must, be, must be connected. And it's this strange sort of, it's in pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Very heavy pieces as well. And he has to, to get it up is really hard. Um, the known, I mean, the known world comes up in a, in, a, in a variety of places. One is here, right, where Moses' world is, has been so limited by his slavery, right? That that's all he knows, so he cannot um, get out. Um, it's about that world and other possible worlds, I think. Um, there's, I think Calvin has, there's a um, photograph that he loves, which is a black and white photograph of a house, and there's a dog, remember there's a dog in the front, the dog is looking off camera, right? And he's like, what is the dog? Like he, that, that is so meaningful to him, that photograph, because he doesn't, what is that dog looking at, right? He can just know what he's seeing, but there's some world over there, right? Which for Calvin, who is both, who is ill at ease in his sexuality and his racial identity and his you know, identity as the, as the son of, of slaveholders, right? For that unease, it's the promise of a world, right? That's beyond what he can know. I think you could riff on the known world even for longer. If anybody wants to riff on that, they can. Um, do you want to riff on it? Go for it. That's great. Yeah. Wait for the. Wait, just wait for the mic. Yeah. Okay. The, the the woman uh, who is you know, she, I see the woman as as kind of like a seer, mm -hmm. and and. The fact that she creates this world, uh, the, creates the painting that shows that whole world, every person, every animal, I think represents, and I'm just getting to this as, as we're, you know, it represents the fact that she saw this, she saw this madness, and she had her vision, even though she was bizarre to other people, she was so deep. Mm -hmm. And, I don't know. So, that, that's, so it's about what she can know, right? She, know, that, she yeah. knows it at yeah. such a deep level. Yeah. She sees this. Yeah. Thing. And then ultimately it comes out. She sees that whole world. She, she creates it in a painting, but it represents the fact that she saw all this craziness. Yeah. And people didn't take her seriously, but she was a, she was a, she was a visionary. She is a visionary, she was a, yeah. She was a shaman. Yeah. She and is. she ultimately, she took them to, she, to Philly. 
And what people can see in the novel often is the oppressiveness of the law. The law will protect you, the law will do this. Even Skiffington, who's the sheriff, he doesn't even really, he believes in the law, even though he doesn't believe in slavery at all, but somehow he believes in the law, right? He's living that impossible contradiction. Um, and what he knows, right, that's all he can see is the law, right? He can't see beyond. That's his, that's his entire frame of reference um, there. So you have everybody's sort of limited points of view and then the Alice's grand omniscient one, right? Um, yeah, I think that's a good reading of it. I have a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. My comment is, um, this is the only book that when I got to the last page, I turned to the first page and started again immediately. <laughs> and I had made extensive notes the first time. <laughs> um, it's really different the second time, by the way. You're already into it, you understand what it's gonna be, for starters. It's a really different reading. Well, I, I've always resisted rereading it, but um, as I get older, I realize it's so pleasurable. Yeah. You miss so much. I'm just wondering how much, you know, where there's truth here. I mean, I found myself reading the recent Colson Whitehead book and scratching my head. Tunnels? Were there tunnels? You know, and, and having to look, yeah. you know, go Trains. back to the history. And um, I felt a little bit uh, betrayed or something. I don't know. It's just, so I, I wonder how much truth there was in these institutions of black slave owners. Mm -hmm. was, was, that, was that a thing? I believe it was a thing, but I also, he, he will say, I did not research it very much. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, right, he says it, it had to be very few, right? Mm -hmm. It was given that black people could not afford right, to buy slaves. It was most likely a few. He does not speak super specifically about it. He did not research it. Um, I think he, realized that that was a phenomenon, that it had happened, and then he took that and ran with it imaginatively from there. Um, you know, truth is just really interesting. Where is the document, there's, you know, just again, the invented documentary truth that's in the novel, the invented census documents, the invented academics, I was looking them up also, the academics who write later, these, you know, white historians who write, um, and I, I was looking them up to say, is that a real person? And it makes you do that. The novel does make you do that. Um, it asks you to. And then also how it departs from realism in general, so that it goes into the realm, like Stanford's entire journey, and Council Skiffington's, right? So in the middle of the novel, you have those long passages. One is um, Stanford's long journey, right, with the crows, um, his despair, and then his rebirth. And then there's sort of the opposite, which is Council Skiffington, after every, his entire plantation is decimated by smallpox, his riding off, right? These two sort of journeys, right, in the middle of the novel, the novel stops to focus on in the middle. And both of them are very magical, right? You're asking throughout both of them, all those people that Council Skiffington sees, all those mixed race people, the Chinese and the black people all together, right? And he, like, is this, you don't know if it's a hallucination? or if it's real, right? So it still plays with realism as well, you can't tell. Um, and you know, he says, and you've read this too in the comments, he says, you know, I lived in a world, I grew up in a world where um, if, where, where the magical was said to exist. So if there was blood on the ground, then, yeah. what happens if there's blood on the ground? If, I can't if remember. it rains, uh, the, yeah. the, uh, when it dries up the, uh, the blood spot would still be there. The blood spot would stay. still be there, right? Where he grew up in a family where, where, where there was kind of magical happenings as well, right? So he loves to play with that. And so he ranges from the really, really tightly realistic and documentary, like documents, all the way into the surreal in there. Um, and I think it's another kind of throwing us um, off balance. I mean, it's... Um, and when you read it the second time, you're ready to be thrown off balance, which is the big difference, and there's pleasure in that too. Um, there's, I think there's the pleasure you get from figuring it out as you go along, and then there's a the pleasure where you go, okay, I know what's gonna happen, let me see what he was doing with me, you know? Yeah. It's not exactly an answer, but, but yes, he plays with that a lot. So. I think that, yeah. Yeah. There's some, do you have a mic? Is the position that the slaves could read or were literate? Um, it was the, the free blacks are taught to read, 
the slaves are not allowed to read. Okay, so the second thing is uh, the ones that are the focus mm -hmm. uh, for this writer's period and mm -hmm. perhaps his uh, message. Mm -hmm. uh, where did they get their religious teachings? Did they read the Bible? They're, no, they were preached to. They were preached to? They're preached to by Christian preachers. I see. And so the Christian preachers, is there anything in the novel about what their source of religious teaching was in terms of... Not that I know of. He does not think highly of them. Um, the Christian preacher, the main preacher, Moffat, tells them that they need to behave on earth and that there will be a better world to come, which is not a great message for a slave. Um, <laughs> and um, so he's not thought of that highly. But they live with Christian teachings. I, I don't know. You don't get a scene of them being taught Christianity. You do get scenes of them being taught to read. I mean, that's a Fern Elston educating the young free blacks. I think um, in terms of um, your, your presentation being very topical, very much so, but um, it's always good to kind of stir things up a little bit and remember that when you serve, if we never did have the opportunity to survey a cross section of the population, which was that there was more uh, awareness and uh, just awareness, if you're using the word, well, we have to talk in relative terms, but there was more awareness, really, but unspoken of, among the cross-section of persons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that certain writers knew or would be at liberty, this is 2003, right, to say that there was a probably a higher level of awareness of the focused population, so that to assume 100% oppression uh, in, of the spirit would not be the case. That's right. Definitely physical, uh, you know. Uh, I'll stop now. That's right. I agree. There's somebody here. There's somebody back there. Go ahead. Hello? Hello. I really like that the scene with the dying guy petting the crows. Um, it seems to me there's another metaphor there. Mm -hmm that maybe it's the, a little bit of a test from the author to the reader. He, he distinguishes one crow from another. They're black crows. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've been out crow watching, but another one comes in and you say, there goes another one. Um, um, so you think it's a, a kind of, are you black people meaning or yeah. that? Yeah. 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 And, the, and he wants to distinguish between the two that's of them, right. even though they look so similar. That's right. That's yeah. the phrase, right? That's how you respect them. Yeah. They, they, well, people, you know, people say, oh, all black people look the same, all Chinese people look the same. And it's like, they, he knows that. He, he knows them, that's right. And it would not do justice to his relationship with each, right? Not to not to speak of them separately instead of as a group. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, okay. I, I would go with that. Wait, so we have one last one here, John. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor, a brilliant uh, and beautiful book that uh, you like best. Um, there was a curiosity about people that kept, that would die in the novel. Um, Mildred killed her husband uh, with, with poison uh, so that she could protect her legacy of her slaves. Uh, Not Mildred. Um, oh, oh, Mildred is um, Henry's mother. Uh, yeah. Uh, What's her name again? But I, but oh, I, I know what's her name. Mildred Townsend, mother of Henry. Uh, She's not the one who does. Oh. It's, it's, um, it's, um, Oh, even more direct. Uh, so it leads to my question. Uh, Henry died. Does that imply that maybe Caledonia kind of, uh, helped him along? I would say no. I want to say no to that. I don't think that we see, I think that her mother is, um, but it is her mother, right, who kills, who wants to hang on to their property, yes, um, and who poisons her, um, her husband over time in order to hang on to their property. Um, no, I, I don't read it that way. And it's funny, I, you know, in, as an English professor, you entertain a lot of different readings and you don't usually say like, no, I don't think so. You know, you just say, that's an industry. But I don't see the evidence for that in there. Does anybody see any? I mean, did, well, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of that. Also, that her mourning for him, her, it seems like it's an actual marriage to me. Okay. 
Thank you. But now I have to reread it and <laughs> Caledonia, right? <laughs> um, sure. Thank you. I get the bonus round. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, it was off the cuff uh, that you know the patrollers maybe were the villains in this to the gentleman's question over there. Um, understanding that wasn't a prepared remark. Um, I, I mean, the idea of uh, a villain period in this yeah. book really intrigues me, and I just wonder what you want to say about that. I mean, to me, the it's a it's significant that Henry Townsend is a black man mm -hmm. owning other black folk yeah. um, in the question of what the real villain is. Yeah, no, um, it's true. You're right about that. And I, to say that they are the villains, they're poor whites, right? They're people who are, and uh, even among them, Barnum Kinsey is a better man, right, than Odin, I think his name is, right? And even among them, there's, there are differences, right? Well, it is good to know that I understand that the patrollers were the, the cops who patrolled the area and kept black people on the plantation. That's right. And that's the historical yeah. truth. And yeah. that's the tradition that continues to this day. That's right. Place. So yeah. although there were subtle differences in the two guys, yeah. no, the still fact good, is, yeah. in the system, they were bad guys. They, no, they were bad guys. And, um, but also think about um, you know, John Skiffington, who is an upright Christian, who does not believe in slavery, who is, who is given a slave and doesn't know what to do with her, right? Who is nevertheless, um, you know, ruling over this, or the, the law, right? The face of the law. Council, I think we could say, is a really bad guy. He's a villain, I think we could say that. Um, so yeah, I mean, we could, we could, hire, we could rank them. But, the, but oh, you're right, there's also a lot of, um, there's a lot of ambiguity. I mean, there are people who are really, do really terrible things who can't, like is Moses a villain, for example, right? Um, he is, he's the overseer. Um, he works um, Celeste so hard she loses her baby, right? We feel for him at least a little bit there. So they're really complicated characters and they're all, I think the main idea is that they're operating in a system where even with the best intentions, they cannot well, it do it. Corrupts everybody. It corrupts everybody. You cannot be a good person in this. Right. It's the known world. Why he why, why he makes the work? World. <laughs> um, it's, do you remember? It's the known world. It's the known world. That's right. In the known world. That's right. It does. Um, he's really he's mad at Elias. I can't remember. He's mad. He's pissed off about something, and it's not even something huge. It could be. Um, I don't even know if it's, I don't even remember if it's related to his courtship of Caledonia or not. Um, but he does it and she loses her baby. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, this, it's that system, the known world, right? Where even people with, you know, with good intentions are trying, are living in unbearable contradictions. So that strikes me as the perfect ending. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. And uh, we'll see you all. Uh, have a great summer.